He's heard it all before. You're a pastor. You're not supposed to get political. You shouldn't be talking about these issues, so just stay out of politics and stick to preaching the gospel. Life, marriage, sexuality, borders, ethnicity, these things aren't political. They're biblical. God's Word has much to say about the culture we're living in. This is Our Watch with Tim Thompson. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Our Watch. I'm Tim Thompson, senior pastor of 412 Church in Temecula Valley. Very glad to be with you on this Sunday, bringing the Word of God into your life. And uh, just to count that a great blessing in my life to be able to do that. With me, as always, is Jake Porter. Jake is also a, uh, a pastor over at 412 Church in Temecula Valley. Pastor Jake, great to be with you. Yeah, it's always great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're uh, in our series right now going through 1 Timothy and going verse by verse, chapter by chapter. It's what we like to do at 412 Church in Temecula Valley. And we're talking today about, well, we're going to talk about money. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, one of those topics that you have to talk to when you get to it. Yep. And that's uh, that's where we're at today. And we both preached a message on this. We're going to share a little clip about that, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about this topic. Take a listen to this. I want to talk to you about who we serve or what we serve as human beings. Because the fact is, as humans, humans were created to worship. You think about it, like the, the relationship we're in with God, we worship him, he's our God, and we, we love him for being our God, and we, we give him the worship that's due to him. But if a person's not a Christian, what or who are they worshiping? Because the fact is, everybody on the planet is worshiping something. That's, that's the, the truth about it, because you know, worship is devoting your time, your focus, your energy, your resources to something. That, that's all acts of worship. So everybody's worshiping something or someone. And what is that? Today, as we, we get into 1 Timothy 6, we're going to see the, the idea of money, and there are some who, who don't treat money appropriately. Understand this, um, God talks about money more than he talks about any other subject in the Bible. More than heaven, more than hell, more than Jesus Christ, God talks about money. And money is not evil in and of itself. The question is, what do we do with it? How do we treat it? Some people, whether they recognize it or not, they worship money. Another word for money is mammon in the scriptures. Jesus said in uh, Matthew 6, 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. Either the person's going to hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and money. You can't have two masters. Early on in, in my marriage, you know, Nikki and I have been married 27 years, and um, when we first got married, we were not really good with our finances, and we would have people say, hey, you want to go out to dinner on Friday night? And you know what my response often was when somebody would ask me as a young married guy what, what my response was if they asked me something like that? I don't know. Let me go check my bank account. Let me go. Let me see if my money will let me go to dinner on Friday night. I don't know if, if, I, if my money wants to be spent on, you know what I mean? I would, I would go to my bank account and go, do I have this? Will my money let me do it? You know what that is? That's the reverse of how it's supposed to be. That is the money being the master over me. I had to go and ask, do I have permission? And that's not good. I had to flip that around. I had to get to the point where I told my money what I want it to do. And you know what that's called? A budget. That's what it is. When you have a budget, you are the master, and the money is the slave. You get to tell the money what to do, and it has to do what you tell it to do. And that is how we're supposed to live as Christians. We, we prioritize our life and what things we value over other things, and then we get to tell our money you're going to go to this, and you're going to go to that, and you're going to go to that, and hopefully you're a good master over it, but that being, you know, being a person who budgets is you being the master over the money. That is how God 
wants it. He doesn't want us to, to serve him and then also try to serve money and let our money tell us what we're supposed to do. I had to get to the point where I realized, okay, do I value going out to eat with my friends and my wife and take my wife out on a, on a dinner date on Friday night? Do I value that? Yes, I do. How much do I value that? What, what am I going to tell, what portion of my money am I going to tell to go towards that? And so once I got to that point where I was the master, the money was the slave, then I, got, I was able to, to never have to answer like that again, where, oh, I don't know, let me see, I, I don't know. I know exactly what my money's doing today. I know what I've told, because I budget. Portion's going to go here, portion's going to go there, and that is the way God wants it to be. You, as you serve God and you don't serve money, what you find is you're doing the things you do in life not to make money but to please God. It says in, in Colossians 3 that whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of, in, of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. This is what we do as Christians. We're not serving money. We're not serving men. We're serving Jesus. And what we're doing is for him. Everything we do is for him. That's a whole paradigm shift for us as, as human beings. As we give our life to Jesus, it's a paradigm shift where no longer are we doing what we used to do, but now we're doing it entirely different. No longer are we doing what the rest of the world does, but we're doing what Christians do. A whole shift in how we approach our money. Verse 10 of our text today is one of the more misquoted verses in the Bible. Many of you have heard people say, money is the root of all evil, right? How many of you have heard money is the root of all evil? You've heard that. But how many of you know that's not biblical? Okay, good. So here, here's what the verse actually says, verse 10. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So it isn't that money itself is evil, because people say money is evil. You know, money's the root of all evil. It, money isn't the root of all evil. Our love for it is the root of all, is a root of all kinds of evil. So it's not the root, but it is a root, there's no doubt. And we as Christians should not have a love for money. We should have a love for God and a use for money. Money is something we use. So money in and of itself is not evil. Money is not an evil thing. It's a necessary thing. And God's word is very clear about that. You know, he, like I said, he talks about money more than any other subject. We need money to live. We, you know, that's just the reality of living here on earth. You have to use money appropriately. It's like any other thing on earth. You know, social media. Is social media evil? No but what do we do with it? That's, that's the question is, what do we as Christians do with the social media? How do we use it to bring glory and honor to God? Or are we using it to bring glory and honor to God? So it's, money isn't evil, but it, when we have a love for it, when you love something, you're devoted to it. And let's face it, most people on earth are devoted to it. They wake up thinking about it. How can I get more? What can I do with it? How can I spend it? How can I have fun? And it's like their mind is wrapped around money. Christians don't wake up thinking, how can I get money? Christians wake up thinking, how can I serve the Lord today? How can I make his name great in my sphere of influence? What can I do for the Lord? So it's a, it's, like I said, it's a paradigm shift for us as believers. Yeah, it's a paradigm shift, and life is going to be different. For, for the, the believer. You know, when we serve God and we don't serve money, we're going to find that, that much changes in our life. I want to go through First Timothy uh, verse 1 here. It says, Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those 
um, those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. Now, I know how this can sound to a person living in America in 2023. We hear these these things like this saying, you know, uh, if you're a bond servant or a bond slave, you know, count your masters worthy of all honor. We hear, oh, you know, slavery and masters, and this just sounds horrible. Um, but if you if you replace the word servant or slave with the word employee, and you replace the word masters with employers, it makes it so much easier to understand, doesn't right. it? Yeah, it's bridging those gaps. Right. You know, we don't live and uh, use those same terms, and, and we got to bridge the gaps a little bit. And you, right. you relate it to the culture that we live in. makes a lot of sense. Right. A bond servant or a bond slave is somebody who purposefully puts themselves into that type of position. Yeah. And, and they're working for somebody. That person is po- providing them a wage. That is what we call employer-employee relationships today. So it be much easier to look at it that way. But one of the things that we know is that when we're serving God, yeah, we're going to make money. That's that's part of living a life. But you know, when you go to work and you go, okay, I'm serving God, even though I'm working at McDonald's or I'm working at you know in the United States Marine Corps, wherever you're working, right? You're getting a wage, but you're serving God. And when you when you go with it with that approach that hey, I'm serving God, it's you're going to find that you're going to be the one of the best examples at work, right? And, and that's what we should be right. as Christians is a good example. People yeah. should be able to look at your life and say, man, there's something different about that person. Right? Man, look at the work ethic of that guy. Look at the work ethic of this lady. You know, we should we should be set apart including in the workplace. Right. You know, and, and talking to the junior hires and high schoolers, letting them know that you're probably, if you don't already have a job, they're going to get a job soon. Uh, and and being worthy of what you're paid, meaning that you work hard. And, and that's something that God blesses is that hard work. Right. Being that example. Yeah. You know, we you know, we should, as Christians, we should know, hey, I'm serving God, so I'm not going to cut corners at work today. Right. I'm serving God, so I'm not going to steal time from the company. I'm I'm serving God, so I'm not going to be doing Bible studies at work while I'm supposed to be working. And I've had Christians tell me, well, you know, I'm I'm a Christian, so I should be trying to find ways to do that. It's like, no, listen, you should try to find ways to work your butt off today, so that way you can set a good example for everybody. On your break, go and do a Bible study. Before yeah. work, after work, do your Bible study. While you're at work, work your rear end off and be the good example for other people. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Employers should want to hire Christians. Right. You know, and, yeah. and employees should want to work for Christians. Absolutely. And we should be setting that that good example. Um, you know, another thing was we're serving God is we're going to find the, the areas that we can give from our godliness, not receive. No, not what can we gain from it. If you look at verse 3 of 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, it says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with uh, disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourself. And the, the whole attitude here is, it's the attitude of what can I gain from my godliness? What can I gain from being a Christian? That's not Christianity. Not at all. It says it, you, the people that focus on what they can gain from it are, are people that are called proud and know nothing. Right. That, yeah. That's kind of like an eye-opening thing. Like, okay, if I'm looking at what I can gain from uh, calling myself a Christian, yeah, you can consider that person proud and, right. and, and knows nothing. Yeah, and that's, that's an area where, as I look at the modern church, especially in America, it's a lot about what can I gain, what can I get, and really, you know, I'll, I'll say this for sure. You gain eternity. You gain yeah. life everlasting in a place called heaven where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more sin. It's going to be wonderful. But you have to give up a lot to be a Christian. You have to be willing to suffer. You have to be willing to do without. You have to be willing to put others before you. God says to esteem others as better than yourself. Um, there's a lot of sacrifice that comes with Christianity. So it's not about what can I gain for the here and now. In fact, for the here and now, you have to be prepared to lose. And those who lose their life, God says, those who are willing to lose their life for my name's sake will find it. 
Right. You, you got to be willing to lose your life to gain it. So um, definitely a paradigm shift living in, in, in the biblical type of Christianity, which is the only true type of Christianity. We got more to talk about this idea of serving God and not serving money. We're going to take a quick break, listen to a word from our sponsor. We will be right back after this. We are in a free speech war. With big tech, Biden is going after independent news that doesn't lockstep with them on COVID, shots, adverse effects, and early treatments. If you value Valley News' award-winning, unbiased journalism and community coverage without a left slant, please support us by going to myvalleynews.com forward slash subscribe and sign up for $5 a month. We can do this. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Our Watch. I am Tim Thompson. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 6 today. And when I say we, I'm talking about myself, who uh, Tim Thompson, a senior pastor of 412 Church in Temecula Valley, and Jake Porter, who is the assistant pastor of 412 Church. Pastor Jake, always a pleasure being with you. Yeah, it's always great to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, we're uh, we're in, like I said, 1 Timothy 6. We're talking about serving God, not money, which is a paradigm shift for anybody new to the Christian faith. And and sadly, even some people who've been walking with the Lord for a while, they're still trying to get this. Um, we're glad they're, they're working towards that. It says in uh, verse 6 that godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. And the the point that I want to bring out in these few verses here is that when you serve God and not money, you're going to find that you're living a life with great contentment. Like he says, that God, that, that it is great, uh, great gain, you know, that, that, that is the true way that we should be living. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you look at our culture, and we live in a culture that is not content by large. Right. A culture that always wants more. And and that has to do with money, too. You know, more money, more and more. And and there's never enough. And and when you're worshiping money, that's going to be the case. There never is enough. Yeah. You're always going to want more. Oh, I need more. I need more, you know. Uh, And and that's kind of the the culture that we live in. But, But what about this principle of contentment? Where, okay, what about you have enough to, to have a house over your head, food on the table, provide for your family, have the things that you actually need, having contentment with those things. Right. That's a rare thing to see in, in people in today's culture, I think. Yeah, we, we live in a culture that everybody wants to get rich quick. Right. You know, I think about Dave Ramsey. Uh, he wrote a book called The Total Money Makeover, and in there he talks about people in line for the lottery, he says, have you seen these people in line at the lottery? Daryl and his other brother, Daryl. He says, these people are not rich. These people are not smart. And I, I tend to agree. Yeah. It's, it's you know, you, you, well, I agree because I, I know what God's word says. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11 says, wealth from get rich quick schemes disappears, quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Yep. When well, you think about all those people that do win the lottery, for a lot of them, what happens once they win? They go, they go bankrupt. Broke. Yeah, yep. they, they way overspend yeah. and, and completely blow everything that, that they right. got and go bankrupt. Right. Well, I mean, the Bible does talk about how to get rich. And, you know, the way you get rich is over time. You store up little by little. In fact, by the way, just for our audience today, just to know this, there's only three ways God blesses how we get our money. Yep. Only three ways. And the lottery isn't one of them. You know, gambling is not one of them. Uh, the three ways are this, hard work, investment, and inheritance. Mm-hmm. Those are the only three ways. When you look at God's words, the only three ways that he blesses our money. Yeah. And I, and the one that we have the most, I don't want to say control over, but the, the one that we can put forth the most is the hard work. Right. Work hard knowing that God blesses hard work. Right. Yeah, but how many how many ads do you see on how you can make so much money and doing nothing? That, that appeals to our flesh as human beings is, I don't want to work hard. Yeah. You know, especially uh, you look at men, you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. What is the curse on men that we're supposed to work hard? You know, yeah. that is the curse that, that off the sweat of our brow, we would make a living. And that, that is something that men have tried to, to get away from for so long. And, and so I'm going to work smart, not hard. Well, there's something to working hard. Working hard is a good thing. At the end of the day, if you've, you put in a good day's labor and you can lay your head down 
on the pillow and fall asleep, you've done well. You know what I found? A lot of these people who are, are lazy, they, they have trouble sleeping at night because they haven't worked their, their, their best. They haven't done their best. They haven't yeah. exerted themselves and they, they end up with trouble sleeping. So yeah, we, we, we have to know that, that there's a way that God wants us to live. And it certainly isn't trying to get rich quick. That kind of, like the Bible says, that kind of money, it goes away quickly. But and, and also those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. It is a temptation that that is all around us. It's on social media. It's it's on, you know, the news. It's everywhere. These ways that people can, can be lazy and still make a lot of money. Right. Especially for young people, you know, the push on on TikTok and and even Instagram and all these different social media platforms of oh you know you could do this and and this is what you could make oh i'm I, you know i did this this and this and now i'm making x amount of money in in passive income by this one little thing you know subscribe here and i'll i'll email you this one thing and and you see those things all over the place and and it's exactly that those the the appeal to our flesh of oh i just have to do a little bit and i can gain all of this again that focus on what I can gain, not what I can do to work hard for the Lord today. Right. Yeah. And and the idea of being content with those things like you've talked about of food on the table, you know, a, a roof over your head, clothes on your body, these are things that God says you don't even have to worry about. Right. You know, he says, I know what you have need of before you even ask. But how many people find themselves worrying about these kind of things? Yeah, absolutely. Wondering when the next meal is going to be wondering, you know, these, these things that we shouldn't have to worry about if we're doing what God has told us to do. Right. And I think that's the big thing is, okay, what has God instructed us to do? And am I actually doing it? Right. You know, and having that heart posture of that, of that second thing we talked about where, um, you know, you're, you're looking for opportunities of what you can give, not what you can gain. I think when you're looking for those opportunities of how you can sacrifice, how you can give, how you can do whatever it takes in your day-to-day -day life to give for the Lord, there's a blessing that comes from that. All of those things you're 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 going to be provided for. Right. You know, I brought up a verse earlier that that God says we're supposed to esteem others as greater than ourselves. And the the beginning of that verse actually and this is in uh, Philippians chapter 2 by the way, but it says um, to look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. And that's one thing that I think people think, well, if I'm, if I'm a Christian, then I'm just supposed to be giving all the time. What's, what's going to happen to me? Well, no, you, you still biblically have the right to be, and, and the responsibility to be taking care of your own things, but you've got to know that, that the Christian life is not a self-centered life. It is an others centered life. It is looking out for the well-being of others and not about gaining for personal. And sadly, you know, like I said, what I see across America is this this call to give your life to Christ. You're going to become wealthy. You're going to be prosperous. Oh, this is going to be great. And all these people flock to a message like that because let's face it, that sounds awesome. Give my life to the Lord, have life everlasting, be rich now and and live my best life now you know all these things that they try to tell you and and they forget to tell you that that the christian life is a life of suffering yeah you know that god said they hated me they're going to hate you yeah i went to a concert recently and and they did an altar call they preached the gospel did all these things before which i thought was great you know but when it came time to actually for that altar call, it was a prosperity gospel. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, these people, like you, you need to tell them the con like what it takes, the right. sacrifice that it takes right. and, and what's going to happen if, by calling yourself a Christian. It was just this prosperity thing. And then, you know, all these people raising their hand and I'm like, yeah. man, these people need to know what it takes too. Right. Count the cost. Right. Right. Well, that's all the time we have for, for today. Pastor Jake, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always a blessing to be here. Yeah, we're going to be in First Timothy. We're actually going to finish up First Timothy next week. So uh, you're not going to want to miss it. Join us next week right here on Our Watch with Tim Thompson. God bless you all. This has been a production of Our Watch with Tim Thompson. We hope you're encouraged to engage the culture around you. We want to invite you to connect with Pastor Tim by going to the Connect page on ourwatch.com. That's O-U-R watch.com. Until next time, this is all of us at Our Watch reminding you to be bold, be strong, and to take back the public square.